I've been thinking a lot lately about this kind of perennial debate about whether it's morally right to try to get money or not. You know, you have your two normal sides. You have like the Ayn Rand types that say that, that selfishness is great and that uh, when everybody works toward their own self-interest, then the, the uh, rising tide lifts all boats and, you know, everybody's better as a result. And then on the other side, you have um, people point out that, oh, well, Jesus told the rich man that he should give away all his possessions and follow him and that some of the most looked up to spirit spiritual leaders like Jesus himself and like Buddha, etc., were poor. They didn't, they didn't really get a lot of money. And I've thought about this a lot, and I think that this is part of a much broader issue uh, that most people on both sides are missing. So that's what I'm going to tell you in this video. So if this issue is something that interests you, then stay tuned because I'm going to give you a solution to this moral dilemma that I think is a lot more satisfying than anything that you normally hear from either of the two sides. Human beings, by our nature, are kind of this transition between animal and divine. We have animal elements and we have divine elements, right? We have an animal body with animal instincts and animal needs, and then we have a spiritual essence uh, that has spiritual desires and spiritual needs. And in most religions, the pathway to enlightenment or to the proper morality is, is um, going from that animalistic state and evolving towards that spiritual state, focusing less on the animal instincts and the animal desires and focusing more on the spirit, acting more as though your essence is spirit rather than your essence is animal. You are both animal and spirit at the same time, but the more you can move towards that spiritual side and away from that animal side, the closer that you are to enlightenment. And you really don't need to follow a particular religious tradition to recognize that this is true, right? Because if you, if you focus on the animal side, uh, you can't come to any satisfying conclusion, right? If you say, okay, well, uh, I'm an animal and my biology tells me that I want to survive and I want to reproduce. That is my purpose as an animal being. Well, where do you go from there? It's pretty unsatisfying because for one thing, uh, the first objective to survive is something that you are going to fail at, right? No matter how good you are, maybe, maybe if you're lucky you live for 100 years, but after that you're going to die. So you are necessarily going to fail, and then even if you succeed at the other objective, at reproducing, let's say you have a thousand children, right? <laughs> you have sex with a lot of women, and you have a thousand children, they all grow up to be happy and healthy and have a thousand children of their own. Well, at the time you're dead, that's not going to do you any good anymore. I mean, you could say that your genes are happy because your genes got to live on. If, if genes have emotion, I don't know. But it's just not very satisfying, right? You you are doomed to fail and there's nothing to look forward to. And then if you put the religious element on top of that, then uh, if you reincarnate in another body, then what, you're just gonna do it again? You're gonna try really, really hard, even harder than last time to survive and reproduce? And then, what, maybe you live 110 years this time and, and then you fail again, right? So, or if you just live one life and then you go to heaven or hell after that, well, uh, which one are you likely to go to if your whole life was dedicated towards survival and reproduction? Right, any possible way that you look at it, the animal instincts, the animal objectives, are just not very satisfying. And the way out of that is to recognize that we have a spiritual nature as well, that we do have this animal nature, but we also have a spiritual nature, and the spirit lives on. Right, the spirit doesn't just die after 100 years. The spirit continues growing, it continues evolving, it continues living, it continues experiencing after the body is dead. So since the body is finite and the body doesn't last very long and chasing bodily desires is necessarily unsatisfying and necessarily going to fail, well obviously it just makes logical sense to chase the spiritual objectives instead because those are the ones that actually last. Now bear with me because I'm getting to the point, but we've established here first that the spiritual objectives are more important. Now we've got to figure out what those spiritual objectives are and thankfully um, everybody kind of seems to converge on that. So I will use Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself. Now one thing that a lot of people miss in that verse is that when Jesus says love others as yourself, well, that presupposes that you love yourself. So Jesus is not only telling you to love other people, but also to love yourself and to love others in equal measure as you love yourself, which makes sense from a spiritual standpoint because we are all equal. We are all God's creation together. 
And uh, some religions would go as far as to say that we are all one kind of cells of one entity. So it makes sense that we would treat each other as equals because we're all part of one body. And it would make sense then, uh, since we're all parts of that collective, that we all value each other uh, the same way that we value ourselves and that we value ourselves the same way as we value everybody else. So that by itself should tell you immediately that to love yourself is a good thing and then to try to bring good things to yourself is a good thing. The part you need to watch out for is when you value yourself more than you value the people around you. That's what's called selfishness. We're all kind of on this journey from the animal to the spiritual, right? Because the animal instincts are what predominate. That's what we are born with, right? We have the desire to eat. We have the desire for power. We have the desire for sex, etc. And my belief is that God gave us those selfish animal desires for a reason. That it is our purpose on this earth to transition from the animal to the spiritual. And so God arranged it in such a way that our animal instincts push us towards experiences that will help us to realize the spiritual. For example, lust leads to love. So if you have desire for sex, well, you have to acquire that sex from another person of the opposite sex. And then once you start having sex with that person, or you start trying to have sex with that person, as the case may be, then eventually that that union, that, that togetherness with that other person starts to awaken that higher spiritual element of love inside you. And then that process happens again when you have children because when you have children, well, your animal biology tells you that you want to take care of this child because this child is carrying your genetics into the future. But by doing so, you start developing those higher feelings for the child. You start loving a child. It's your natural animal instinct that's kind of pushing you towards higher values. Here's another example. Uh, you want power. So the only way to get power, really, because you can't just beat the king over the head and take his crown and then now you have power, right? Power comes from cooperation with other people. In fact, this is something we see with chimpanzees, that if the biggest, strongest chimpanzee uh, takes the role of the alpha male and then is a tyrant to all the other chimpanzees, then a couple of other chimpanzees who are smaller and weaker will get together, will cooperate with each other and uh, fight the big chimpanzee and rip him to pieces because there's two of them or three of them or four of them and only one uh, the tyrant alpha male. So people cooperate because they desire power and that cooperation leads to people being able to meet each other's needs and is the precursor to brotherly love. Now here's another example that gets to the point that I talked about in the beginning about whether or not chasing money is good or bad. Well, you have a certain amount of greed and that greed motivates you to go out and figure out how to make a lot of money. Well, in figuring out how to make a lot of money, you have to learn a lot of things. One, you have to learn discipline. Two, you have to learn to work hard. Three, you have to learn courage, right? You have to learn the courage to beat the uncertainty that is all around you because the rest of the world is trying to beat you down and hold you back from reaching your goal. And then maybe most importantly is you have to learn to care about others' interests, right? Because if you can't meet other people's needs, if you can't allay other people's fears, if you can't help other people's dreams come true, then they're never really going to pay you any money. The way that you make money, at least in a capitalist society, is by providing things of value to other people. So it's basically impossible for a person who is completely self-centered to ever make very much money because they just don't know how to provide value to other people because they don't know what other people want. And I see this all the time with people who are trying to make a lot of money and maybe they're really good in some ways, like they're really disciplined and they're really hard working, but it just hasn't gotten through their head that in order to make money, they have to care about other people's needs and other people's feelings and actually meet other people's needs. And so they're working and working, working and plugging away and, and diligently sending messages to everybody. Um, but it's, it's so painfully obvious that it's all about them that nobody ever wants to buy from them. The point is that in trying to get rich and trying to make a lot of money, well, eventually you are going to have to start recognizing that selfishness just doesn't work and you're going to start having to have empathy for other people and providing value to other people. So this, this quest that you are on to enrich yourself 
is going to force you to be better to other people. It's going to force you towards that ideal of loving your neighbor as yourself because it is only through loving your neighbor that you can receive love yourself. So this is what the Ayn Rand type people are talking about, or like Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand, that when people work towards their own self-interest, it's like there's this invisible hand that's pushing the world towards a better world for everybody. So what they have to say is absolutely true on one level, but I would also make the case that that is not the highest level, that there are higher levels of good than what these people are talking about. By the way, I know this video is not exactly what I usually do, so let me know in the comments, is this something that interests you? Should I do more of this, or you just don't want to hear about my opinions about morality? Let me know in the comments either way. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up button because it makes the YouTube algorithm like me better, and hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon beside the subscribe button so you get all my videos that are coming out in the future. So if you talk to the people who say that getting rich is bad, you say that I think that getting rich is good because, you know, it lifts the economy and you have to focus on others to get rich, etc., etc., etc. Well, then they'll tell you, oh, well, uh, Jesus wasn't rich, or Gandhi wasn't rich, or Buddha wasn't rich, etc. And of course, they're right when they say that, but I think they're missing something huge, and that is that all of those people could have been rich. They could have been extremely rich. I mean, if you think about Jesus, uh, all the talents that he had, I mean, just, just turning water into wine, if he had monetized that, he could have been the richest man in the world. Not to mention raising people from the dead, not to mention even, even having multitudes of people crowded around him to hear him speak. The fact is that Jesus was extremely successful and he could have charged for his services and could have been extremely rich, whereas these Poor people who are justifying their poverty uh, are acting like they're on the same level as Jesus because they're poor and he was poor, even though for Jesus it was a choice. For them, it's not a choice. They can't make money because they don't offer anything of value to the world around them. The problem is that they're confusing weakness or they're confusing uselessness with virtue. They think, oh, I'm poor because I can't do anything. I don't have any skills. I don't do anything good for the world around me. Nobody ever wants to pay me anything, but I'm going to say that it's because I don't care about money. You know, probably half these people would rob all the old ladies in the nursing home if they had the chance, if they thought they could get away with it, right? But they pretend that they're righteous because they don't have the chance. In fact, I'd go so far as to say even that people who are great and terrible, like a Hitler, a Stalin, or a Mao, are more morally evolved than most of these poor people who complain about rich people. Like, if you think about Stalin, right, he was charismatic, he had a great work ethic, he was very effective in a lot of ways, he must have been fairly intelligent. It seems to me, for every person like him, for every Stalin in the world, there are a thousand or ten thousand people who would be equally bad, but are never gonna have the opportunity because they're too stupid, they're too lazy. They sit around all day whining about rich people instead of actually doing something with their lives. I've seen this a lot. I've seen poor people that are complete tyrants to everybody that's around them. Whenever they have the tiniest little bit of opportunity, whenever ever they have a slightly higher position than somebody else, they act like complete tyrants, but they're not smart enough, they're, they don't work hard enough, uh, they're not charismatic enough to ever get in a position of very much power, so nobody's ever going to know how terrible they are. They're just going to be terrible in obscurity, terrible and weak. So don't make the mistake of confusing weakness for virtue. Anyway, I'm getting off on a rant here. So Jesus and Buddha, etc., provided a lot of value for society, and they could have been rich if they wanted to. Another really interesting example of this is a guy named Chico Xavier. If you don't know, I've been living in Brazil for a while, and, and Chico Xavier is a, a spiritual medium, a guy who receives spirits and writes books. Basically, the, the spirits write through him. And Chico Xavier, through these spirits, this is a guy who's, who's basically illiterate. He comes from a small town, he doesn't have much education, but he's written, I think, over a hundred books now, and he's sold millions and millions and millions of copies. He's like a best-selling author in Brazil, and he hasn't kept a penny of the royalties, because, as he says, that he's not the author, right? The spirits are the authors, so it would be unfit for him to keep any money from them. But anyway, another example of this guy is a huge celebrity, he's a best-selling author, and he's done a ton of good for society. He could be extremely rich if he wanted to, but he's kind of reached that next level where the, the money just doesn't matter to him very much. Where he's so spiritually evolved 
that even though he provides a ton of value to the people around him, he doesn't ask for the money. By the way, if you want to learn more about Chico Xavier, he's an absolutely fascinating character. Uh, there's a, a brilliant movie on Netflix. It's a Brazilian movie called Os Mais de Chico Xavier, which I will put a link in the description. Um, don't worry, it's, it has subtitles in English. I totally recommend watching that if you have Netflix. So there's kind of two stages of, of human evolution here. One stage where you're just completely focused on yourself and you don't care about anyone else, to the stage where your focus on yourself drives you to care about the people around you and you are providing a, a large amount of value to everybody around you and you're getting very rich as a result. And then a third stage where you care about providing the value and you don't care about the money. And that might mean that you're not collecting money or it might mean that you're collecting money but then donating it all uh, to other people. And that's actually very common among rich people is that they will donate the vast majority of money that they're getting. So you might think of a human spirit as, as progressing like this. First, it's basically completely dormant and the person is just completely an animal, right? The person, uh, when it wants something, it goes and gets something. If it wants sex, it rapes. If it, if it wants power, it kills the guy in power and, and takes it for himself. If it wants food, it, it steals from the other person. And then after a little while, it probably realizes that strategy doesn't work very well. That if it tries to steal food, well, maybe the other person that owns the food starts fighting back. Or maybe the person goes to jail, etc. Right? It doesn't work very well. So they start to learn temperance. That they can't just take what they want. That they have to uh, work within the system a little bit. And so that probably puts them at the position where they get some menial job. Or maybe they get a decent job and they're, they're managing to take care of themselves alright. And then if they want to get to the next level, if they want to get to a point where they actually have uh, more money than average or they want to have power, then they're going to have to start learning to have empathy. Right? If they're going to get to that level, they're going to have to start providing value for other people on a larger scale. And they're going to keep on learning lessons just like that along the way to trying to better their own situation. Their own selfishness is going to push them to learn these spiritual values. And then probably at some point they're going to have to learn to be humble, right? Like I talked about in this video that if you have a lot of pride, if you have a big ego, then it's going to be difficult for you to learn. It's going to be difficult for you to put yourself in a position where you can really get better. If you can't admit that you're in a low position, uh, then you're going to stay in a low position because you have to admit the problem before you can get any better. So just there, selfish motives alone have caused this person to learn temperance, to learn empathy, and to learn humility. So don't feel bad about working for your own interests, right? Because you are progressing. This is forcing you to grow and evolve spiritually. And eventually, if you keep working and working and working towards money or power or sex or whatever it is that you are trying to get, eventually you pick up so many values along the way, you become so spiritually evolved that at some point, because of that quest for that selfish interest, at some point, that selfish interest you find doesn't even interest you anymore. Like the old hymn says, that the things of the world become strangely dim. So really the worst sin is laziness. Because if you were, if you were striving for something, whatever that thing may be, even if it's something that's completely selfish, you are going to be forcing yourself to grow. But if you're sitting around, uh, snacking on Doritos, watching TV 15 hours a day, and not striving for anything, that's when you can't grow. But even in that case, progress is inevitable. That's the way that God set up this world, is that when we do something wrong, we recognize that the results are not the results that we hoped we would get. So if you're sitting around uh, eating Doritos on the couch all day and never doing anything, well, eventually you're gonna, life is going to start sucking enough that you have no choice but to do something. Laziness will make you completely miserable, as will just about any other sin, and so if you do it enough, you start to recognize that this isn't making you happy, it's not making your life better, and then you change. Some people change quickly, some people change slowly, but everybody changes. Progress is inevitable, and it's kind of up to you how fast you want to progress. And you, can, you, you also have the choice of progressing by love or by pain. Right? You can progress spiritually because you're excited about progressing spiritually, or you can progress because your life is completely unbearable because of the things that you've been doing wrong. The choice is yours. 
Now, if you're listening to this and you're recognizing that that's your situation, you're the guy uh, sitting on the couch eating Doritos and watching TV all the time, and you recognize that, yeah, my life kind of does suck and I want to stop before it gets worse, and maybe you don't have a good idea of where to start. Like, you know that you want to try striving for something, but the idea is so foreign to you because you've become so complacent you don't even know where to start. I would recommend checking out my course Digital Nomad University. I'll put a link down in the description. It's all about how you can go from working a normal desk job or living the normal life to making money from a computer and traveling the world. So if you need inspiration, if you need something to work towards in the short term, just so you can have that growth and you can figure out uh, what it is that you wanna be doing with your life in the long term, I think that's an amazing place to start. So, so check out the link in the description, sign up for that course. That'll give you a great place to start. And if you wanna learn more about how to find purpose in your life instead of spending your whole life sitting around on the couch eating Doritos, then check out this video all about how the movie Fight Club can help you find your purpose. And if you found this video helpful, if you think it'd be helpful to other people, please share it on social media. And of course, don't forget to subscribe.